Welcome to another Bible study from the New Testament letter of Romans. I'm glad you've chosen to join us again, and I'm really excited to continue our look at what awaits the saints of God in heaven. As we discovered last week, believers are bound for glory. This is guaranteed because positionally we're glorified already. According to Ephesians 2.6, here's what that verse says. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Seated in heaven, past tense, done deal. But in daily experience, of course, we're still stuck in the earthly realm. And while we're here, our, our hearts ache for what is to come. We desire to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord, which is, which is far better. And that's the focus, really, of today's study from Romans chapter 8, verses 19 through 27. A passage we will look at together in some detail after we pray together. God in heaven, we thank you that we can come before you again in Jesus' name. You've bid us to call. We have access by grace. It is grace in which we stand. We thank you, Father God, that we are able to come boldly with our requests. And we do that today. I ask, Father, for those that are watching, those that are listening, Father, wherever they are today, that they would be able to come into your presence in a special way, that they would understand the things that your word has, that your Holy Spirit would illuminate the text, and that we would be able then to make decisions in our lives. And that, Father, you would change us into your image. I pray, Father God, for great things to come because of the time that we've carved out from our busy schedules for this study in the Bible. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the key word in this text would be the word groan. Groan, because it's found three times in the nine verses here. Um, what we see, first of all, is that creation groans for glory. Creation groans for glory. This is in verses 19 through 22. And here we see Paul personifies creation, giving it a human quality to help us understand what he's teaching. Now, let me read those verses and you'll see what I mean. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Now by creation, the apostle means the non-rational parts of nature, both animate and inanimate. Thinking, reasoning beings are not included. He can't be talking about angels because they were never subjected to futility and corruption, right? Believers have their own section in a few verses. And certainly Satan and the demons and unbelievers would never long for Christ to come back and set things right. So he's not talking about people here. He's talking about the physical world of matter, plants, and animals. Nature. Nature itself, he says, is aching for liberation from the curse of sin. And it's doing so with eagerness. This is an interesting word. It literally means with an outstretched head, reaching toward what is to come. The picture is vivid. Creation is standing on its tiptoes in expectation. Think about that. Creation, nature, is standing on its tiptoes in eager expectation because it can't wait for the sons of God, believers in glory, to be revealed. Now listen, as far back as Isaiah 65, 17, God promised new heavens and a new earth. But what Romans adds to the picture is that nature's destiny is linked to ours. It will be liberated when we are liberated at Christ's return. Listen to Colossians 3 and verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, appears then you also shall appear with him in glory. That's what he's talking about, the revelation of the sons of God. When Christ appears, we shall appear with him. At that time, creation will cease its groaning. Now, what, what is the link between us, between uh, nature, between creation and man? Well, the, the link is Adam's sin. You know that God made everything good, right? The first chapter of Genesis tells us that, and it was good, and it was good. And at the end of creation, End of the week, and it was very good. 
But sin has corrupted what God created. That's why God tells Adam in Genesis 3.17, the ground is cursed because of you. It is this declaration of a curse that Paul is talking about when he says here that, that, um, uh, that God subjected creation to futility. Something that wasn't done willingly on the part of creation, but as a response to Adam's rebellion. This is my father's world and it's beautiful and God has made it marvelous. But it is not what it was intended to be. It is not what it was fully supposed to be because of the taint of sin. And so it says here in the verse that the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God because the creation was subjected to futility, to this vanity, this condition that it's in now, not willingly, not by its own accord, but because of Adam. And then there was the curse that was placed upon them. But that same verse includes a promise of, of coming restoration. Because it says, because the creation also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of hope, of God. So that's why in verse 20 it says, it was subjected to futility by God, not willingly, but because of him who did so in hope. So the, the picture here is that creation is linked to us because it was man who sinned. It was man who brought um, this sin into the world. And that has affected everything in creation. And so that's something that, that we see that exists even today, right? But creation is headed for a restoration. There's a new heaven. There's a new earth that is going to come about. God has promised that. And so in the meantime, creation is groaning, groaning, waiting for the reverse of the original curse. Now the word groaning speaks of the utterances of a person caught in a dreadful situation with no immediate prospect of deliverance. So there, I, I wouldn't really say despair because there is an expectation there, but it could be a long way off. And so there is this groaning in the meantime. There is a promise given by the promise maker who does not lie, but creation is stuck now in this in between awaiting the second part of the verse while it has to exist in the first part. So these things, Paul says, that they're going through this groaning is like labor pains, but they presage new life, new life. The second thing we see is that Christians groan for glory. Creation groans for glory, so do Christians. Not only that, Paul continues in verse 23, but believers groan as well. So here's verse 23 saying that. Not only that, but also we who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Let's stop there for a moment. We've obviously moved from non-rational objects, nature, to rational beings in the section here, verses 23, 24, and 25. But even here, not all rational beings are included. You see, this is an exclusively Christian longing. Ungodly people don't grieve over the presence of sin in their lives. And they obviously don't suffer for their faith in Christ. So this is something that is peculiar to believers in Christ. And so we have this groaning, this aching in our heart, this desire in our spirit for that which is to come. Unbelievers, I mean, this life is all, they, is all they've got. They aren't looking to glory for something to come because they're all caught up in the here and now. But for those of us who know that there is a heaven awaiting, we do indeed groan because we, we want to go there. You know, one of the things that I've always appreciated about children of God, and I, across the country or across the world, I've met Christians who I, I, just, I just meet them and they have one thing in common is they love Jesus like I do. But the second thing is they can't wait for Christ's return. It's called the blessed hope for a reason. Because it's so much better ahead. It's so much better up there. And as believers, we have the best of both worlds. And so we, we love life and, and we love living for the Lord here. And we have a, a purpose and we understand why we're here and what we're supposed to do. But this is nothing compared to what is to come. And so there is this, this groaning that we have as well. Now it's an expectant grief 
as we mentioned, because Romans has already given us the assurance of eternal life in a place that the Bible describes this way from Revelation 21. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. That's what we're looking forward to. Nothing in this life, as wonderful as it is, could compare to the life that is to come. But that's an understanding that only Christians have. We know that it does get better than this. Far better. Better beyond measure. Better beyond any ability to imagine or conceive or place it into words. It's going to be the most wonderful thing in the universe. You know, as a pregnant woman joyfully endures the pain of childbirth because of the child about to be born, so believers in Christ look forward to our safe delivery up in glory. And there are three phrases in this verse. We're not done yet with verse 23. There are three phrases that reinforce this assurance for us. The first one here is the redemption of the body. Actually, this is the third one. I'm going to work Work them backwards in the verse. The redemption of the body, which is a reference to the resurrection, the chief element in a Christian's eternal hope. We live in a body. We suffer in a body. So it only makes sense that we will be resurrected in a body, a glorified spiritual body with no limitations and that will last forever. You see, our souls were redeemed at our conversion. But salvation isn't complete until our body is redeemed as well. So Jesus said in, in the Gospel of John, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, yet he shall live. He's saying that because he lives, we will live also. In a new life, in a new body that is attuned to spiritual things. And does not react or respond as our physical bodies do here. This promise of a resurrected body is the first assurance during these days of our groaning. But there's another one here in the verse, and that is the term, our adoption as sons. Now, we talked about adoption last week, didn't we? And so, in, in one sense, we've already received the adoption of, of the sons of God. Something we learned about in verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received, past tense, the spirit of adoption, by whom we can cry out, Abba, Father, Daddy, Father, right? We talked about that. We are part of God's family right now. Listen, eternal life doesn't begin when you die. Eternal life begins when you place your trust in Christ. When I came to receive Jesus as my Savior as a young child, eternal life began. Oh, but not in its fullness, well, not even close. We don't enjoy all the privileges of our adoption this side of glory. Now, again, the custom that Paul is talking about is the Roman custom of adoption. And they had a very important ceremony in which the adopted child was acknowledged publicly as the son and heir. It was a grand celebration. It was a coming of age. And that ceremony, that experience, forms the basis for what Paul is talking about here in verse 23. He says that when Christ returns, we will come with him. He says that when he is revealed, we will be revealed as sons of God, heirs of the promise in a public way. And so he is saying that we have the spirit of adoption now. We have um, a place in the family of God. We have a spiritual inheritance. But there is coming a time, yet future, but closer by the day, when we will know as we are known. When we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. When we shall be declared formally, publicly, to be the heirs of God, and we will reign with Jesus forever and ever. So, we will receive a new body. That's a guarantee of what is to come. And we will be revealed as God's eternal heirs. But there's one more assuring phrase in verse 23. He mentions here the, the first fruits of the Spirit. Now, in Old Testament Israel, the first fruits were the, the first portion of the crops presented to the priest as an offering that consecrated the entire harvest yet to come. And Paul says that the Holy Spirit is our first fruits. Listen, the Holy Spirit is God's down payment on the full inheritance 
that he has promised is waiting for us. This is so clearly given to us in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1 and verse 14. Ephesians 1, 14, where it says this, He is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise, <laughs> the praise of his glory. What marvelous assurance comes just from this one verse, looking forward to what is to come. Yes, we groan in the moment, but oh, what God has planned for us, brother and sister, is literally out of this world. And these things provide hope, a coming body, a fullness of adoption, and the fullness of the Spirit who has been given to us now as a down payment and all that is to come. We see this hope mentioned in verses 24 and 25. Let me continue with those. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Hope isn't wishful thinking. Hope is a settled confidence in the promises of the one whom Scripture says cannot lie. The Bible just doesn't say God won't lie. It also says he cannot lie. His promises are yes and amen. Has he not said and will he not do it? And this hope sustains us in our groaning time. Now we saw last week that we don't receive our spiritual inheritance until we get to heaven, right? If we had it now, there would be no need for hope because you don't hope for something you already possess. That's what Paul's saying in verse 24. He says it wouldn't be hope if you had it because you don't hope for what you have. <laughs> you hope for what you don't have. But he says because of the object of our hope, God himself and the promises made in his word, verse 25 goes on to say that we have uh, an ability then to eagerly wait for that which we hope for with perseverance. So having it is better, and we're going to, but in the meantime, God gives us a settled hope that we can hang on to, no matter what's going on around us. Nothing can take it away. Nothing will diminish it. Nothing can change it. The world didn't give it to us. The world can't take it away. God loves it. He won't take it away. We have this hope, this blessed hope, that keeps us going forward. And in the meantime, we are able to be excited and, and, and uh, positive and calm and confident. We have hope in the present that will bear fruit in the future when faith becomes sight and hope becomes possession. Paul said it well in 2 Timothy 1.12, I know whom I have believed, he said. Let me say that again. I know who I have, I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed unto him against that day, until that day. I can say that, my friend. Can you? Do you have the confidence that comes from knowing you belong to Christ? Knowing that what he has said will happen, will happen in his time, for his glory, but for our benefit? Are you able to say with Paul and, and humbly with me, I know whom I have believed, and I am fully persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Oh, friends, creation groans for glory. Christians groan too. But there's one more use of the word in the text. It's a very interesting one. We see that next. Now I want you to see that the Comforter groans for us as we await glory. The Comforter groans for us as we await the glory that we've been talking about. And the verse 26 is introduced with the word likewise or in the same way. And well, it connects our groaning with the groaning of the third person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is called the Great Comforter. His ministry is front and center in these last two verses of our text, 26 and 27. Would you watch with me? Likewise, in the same way, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings, there's our word, with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Wow, there's a lot of stuff to unpack right there, isn't there? But here's the message. As we groan, he groans. We are weak, 
verse 26 says. We are vulnerable to spiritual attack. We are uncertain which way to proceed. But the Spirit of God helps us in our weakness by enabling us to pray as we should according to the will of God. That's what it says here. So that statement, we don't know what we should pray for as we ought, is not just, this is important, it's not just true sometimes, it's true all the time, because in a very real sense, we cannot know perfectly the complete will of God on any subject. Are you following me here? I'm not saying that we don't have any understanding. Obviously, we do. We do. I'm not saying that God hasn't given us directions and markers and guidance. Of course He has. Praise God. But when you think about it, there's a lot of things God knows that we don't know. And so our prayers are never going to be perfectly, completely in alignment. I mean, we won't know we're doing that. We can't make that happen because we are finite, because our perspective is off. And so when he says we don't know what we should pray for as we ought, he means it. Don't, don't add any caveats to that. He's making a statement, a sweeping statement that says, in general... Though we love him and though we have a relationship with him, we don't know exactly what we should pray. Not how to pray. He told us how. We don't know what. We don't know exactly what to say. Haven't you felt that way before? Of course you have. I have too. But I'm talking about the fact that in, in, if you think about it in the larger sense, we need his help for every prayer because we don't have full knowledge. That's why it's foolish to complain when God allows things into our lives that we don't like. We don't know what God knows, but the Spirit of God does. He understands perfectly. And the scripture says here, in a personal and a direct way, He brings our request to the Father, praying with utterances that are too deep for words. They're, they're inexpressible. Now this isn't the gift of tongues, because it's the Spirit uttering, not us. The Spirit knows the Father's mind, and the Father knows the Spirit's mind. So there can be an intercession, that means to, to plead our case. The Spirit can plead our case with the Father and the throne of heaven. And in so doing, He helps our weakness. The word help, it, it's a small word, and you might think you know what it means, and it means more than you think. It actually translates a, a really big Greek word that I'm not sure I could even say, so I'm not going to try. But it means, it speaks of someone coming alongside us and helping us bear a heavy burden. So it says the Spirit of God helps us. He is moving. He is coming alongside. He is coming up to us. We are struggling under a heavy load. And he helps us bear it. He, he puts his shoulder to that with us. And he's talking in the context of prayer and prayer um, according to God's will, because that's, that's the kind of prayer that's answered, right? That's what he says. He helps us in our weaknesses because we do not know what to pray. Can we be honest? Aren't there a lot of questions about prayer? Have you ever asked some of these? I bet you have. What should I pray for? How should I pray? Can I just claim this by faith, or do I have to add, if the Lord wills? What happens if I pray wrongly? Does prayer get God to change his plans? And if not, why do I even pray at all? No, those are questions you've asked. Those are familiar, I'm sure. But Romans 8, 26 and 27 assures us that we have someone helping us at each point in our personal struggle with prayer because the Spirit does know what and why and how we should pray. He helps us shoulder the load. He ensures the result in God's will and God's time. Have you ever picked up a piano before? <laughs> not by yourself, right? But have you ever been asked to help somebody move an upright piano. I've been asked to help and I've helped asked others to help. I, I find that you can lose a lot of friends that way. Most people uh, won't move a second piano for me, right? It's about a 500 pound uh, dead weight instrument, okay? You need helpers. So you call a couple of guys and you convince them to take a corner of the thing and you all give the heave ho, right? You haven't asked them there for a discussion you're not going to talk about music and how nice the piano looks and, and where it came from and you're there for a job. And you want strong men with broad shoulders to help you do the moving. This is a time for grunting and groaning, not talking. And so you find some place to hang on to it. There's a couple little places that some can hang, but 
oftentimes you're left to your own devices. I've done this too many times. I speak from experience. And you're lifting and you're saying, oh, Lord, help this to be a quick trip to the, to the, to the pickup and wherever it's going next. But the thing is, there's a time for words and there's a time for grunts and groans and work. What I want you to see is that when you are bearing a burden and words fail you, when you are lifting a request to God that's at least as heavy as that upright piano, groans are entirely appropriate. So in the hard work of prayer about something beyond your control or something beyond your understanding, grunt away, brother. But be aware that God's Spirit is right there groaning with you. You don't have to be eloquent. You need to be faithful. You don't need to say the right words. Nah, not at that point. We are groaning. He groans with us. The prayer makes it to heaven. God's will is done. That's, that's good stuff right there. Now, should we pray? Well, of course. Pray without ceasing, the Bible says. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, the Bible says. It's great to pray. We're supposed to pray. Jesus said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be open. Prayer doesn't change God. Prayer changes us. It is a grand partnership with the divine because the one who ordains the end also ordained the means. Did you get that? The one who ordains the end, his glory, his will, ordained the means, prayer. So of course we should pray. And we should be humble enough and recognize that we cannot do this on our own. And so the Holy Spirit of God comes alongside and intercedes or, or makes our case for us. Prayer doesn't change God's will. He has ordained that from the beginning of time, but he gives us the opportunity to have a part in what he has. And we will know, and we will make it forward. Listen, my friend, as you groan on the way to glory, please know that creation grows with you, and the Comforter groans for you. You will make it through, not in one giant leap, but through a whole series of steps taken one at a time in dependence on the Spirit of God, beginning with your very next one, folks. What are you going to do for God? Where are you going to go? What is God telling you to do right now? By His grace and at His urging, will you do that? Don't worry about there. You do what He tells you to do here. Well, God bless you as you do that, as you walk with Him this week. We'll see you again next time.